okay because I just changed the internet today. Yes. So the uh, the system is telling us that meeting is now streaming live on custom live streaming service. So we need uh, we need a confirmation that we should start. Uh, we are live. So good evening and good evening uh, to tonight, dear members of Memory Studies Association, dear participants of the meeting. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome on behalf of the co-organizers, our special guests for today. We were absolutely thrilled when Anne Applebaum and Agnieszka Holland agreed to speak at our conference. We are meeting tonight with the most insightful observers of European and also global politics, memory cultures and entanglements with the past, deeply and actively engaged in public conversation. Uh, both our guests with their work and talents earned the position of public intellectuals and became influential and impactful translators explaining Eastern Europe to the world. Uh, in their diverse and absolutely impressive creative practice, they not, not only explained life after communism, under communism, but also facilitated conversations between Poles and Jews and advocated for Eastern European repressed groups. So to sum up, we, one cannot imagine better guides whose knowledge and con communication talents can help to shed light for the MSA global audience on the tumultuous times in which we lived and have been living in Eastern Europe. There are myriads of questions one can ask them. So to steer us through the wealth of issues, we have invited Sofia Diak and Simon Lewis, two scholars representing what we believe is the voice of new generation of memory scholars. Let me briefly introduce our guests who in fact, for many of you, I'm sure need absolutely no introduction. So Agnieszka Holland is a film director. She's an Academy Award nominee, president of the European Film Academy and a board supporting LGBT rights. Critics often praise her ability to roll American storytelling and the history and legacy of Europe all into one, reaching audiences across the world. She started directing in Poland in the 70s, soon telling her stories to the global public. Agnieszka uh, started, uh, Agnieszka Holland is one of the co-authors of screenplays to Krzysztof Kieślowski, Andrzej Wajda's films, not to mention her other artistic engagement, like that she also acted in Krzysztof Zanussi film and translated Milan Kundera's work into Polish. With films like The Lonely Woman, Europe, Europe, In Darkness, Mr. Jones, and the recent Charlatan, she can be with no doubt considered an eloquent and impactful conversant in our debates on memory. When Agnieszka Holland was leaving Poland after 1989-81 to observe Eastern Europe from other vantage points and to direct films like The Secret Garden, Total Eclipse, Washington Square, Copping Beethoven, and also TV series like Treme, uh, Wire, and House of Cards, Anne Applebaum was starting her work on Eastern Europe and Soviet history at Yale. She moved to Poland from Oxford in 1988 so before the, just before the fall of the Iron Curtain as a correspondent for The Economist. Today, the American historian, journalist, academic teacher and staff writer at The Atlantic is a Pulitzer Prize winner for Gulag published in 2003 and one of the leading experts on authoritarian populism. She has recently published The Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lore of Auto, 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 Authoritarianism that came out last year with Double Day. Her other books include Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944-1956, that was published in 2012, and Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, from uh, also uh, from Double Day, 2017. She is a regular contributor to the press, reaching a, broad, a very broad audience. She has written extensively on Soviet totalitarianism, and Central and Eastern Europe after the Second World War using political and historical lenses, but also applying more experiential approaches of traveling, 
cooking and establishing her family. Today, we hope she can share with us her panoramic view on mnemonic entanglements of the region she observed with such a perceptiveness for at least the last three decades. Anne Applebaum and Agnieszka Holland conversants will be, as I mentioned, Sofia Diak, Simon Lewis. Sofia is a director of the Center for Urban History of East Central Europe in Lviv, Ukraine, a former fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University, and the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. She focuses on post-war transformations, heritage practices, and public history. Simon is an associate professor in East and Central European cultural history at the University of Bremen, Germany, and co-chair of the Polish Memory Studies Group. He works on transnational cultural history, focusing on visual cultures of Belarus, Poland, Russia, and Ukraine. He is a co-author of Remembering Cutting from 2012 and the author of Belarus Alternative Visions, Nation, Memory, and Cosmopolitanism that was published by Routledge 2019. So our plan for this session is uh, that Sofia and Simon will lead a conversation with our distinguished guest, and this will be followed by questions from, from the audience as, usually, as usual. So at this point, I will make uh, a few logistical notes. Um, as you know, we cannot see the audience rising hands, but you can put your questions and comments in chat at any time. Uh, we will collect them and then read them out. Uh, I would like to thank our technical moderators for today, Matteo Mazzini and Jenna Chandu and all others involved in streaming this meeting for their support. So Simon, Sofia, over to you. Thank you so much, Roma, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you to Agnieszka and Anna, our very distinguished guests, for joining us today. I'd like to say just a few words to begin with about the title of our session. We've called it Remembering Dark Times because memory often solidifies around dark times. <clears throat> Violent, traumatic episodes can haunt the present for decades, sometimes through their politicized suppression and struggles for remembrance and sometimes through their instrumentalization, and almost always through their multiple forms of individual and collective scarring, uh, and to borrow Michael Rothberg's term, uh, implication. <clears throat> Today we have the privilege of discussing memories of dark times with, as Roma said, two of the most prominent and most sensitive storytellers of the violent chapters of Europe's history. Um, they're both, uh, both um, <clears throat> intellectuals, of course, who are also connected to Warsaw, the, the site of our conference, and also a site of many dark uh, periods of history. We could, however, have also called the session Remembering in Dark Times, without wanting in any way to relativize the horrors of the 20th century. Our times are in their own way un undoubtedly troubled. Climate crisis, the global crisis of liberal democracy, state brutality and bloody wars on nearly every continent, and of course, over 4 million deaths and counting worldwide of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hannah Arendt wrote that humanity knows many periods of dark times in which the public realm has been so obscured and the world has become so dubious that people have ceased to ask any more of politics than it showed due consideration for their vital interests and personal liberty. <clears throat> she also proposed friendship and openness to the world as antidotes, as ways of coping with this darkness. Our two honored guests today offer an, an antidote that Arendt didn't really talk about so much memory. In their writing and audiovisual st storytelling, they bring the past into dialogue with the present and offer, maybe not solutions, but at least an opening of the past for endless examination so that we might understand and learn from it. Um, <clears throat> so now I'll pass over to Sophia. We have a, a few questions which we'd like to ask. Sophia will ask the first one. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And to open our conversation, I would like to ask you, Anne and Agnieszka, to take us to your family stories. Um, in memory studies, researchers explore the way past experiences, especially traumatic and violent, are transmitted or silenced 
for the families. They use the concept of post-memory coined by Marianne Hirsch. Um, at the same time, history comes um, and tend to come to us as grand narratives, whether it's schools or museums, prioritizing rather the stories of large groups, national or the perspective of state. And they frame these large narratives um, the way we talk about individuals, the way we talk about families, um, and even block them, especially then these family stories don't fit. And in Eastern Europe, we have lasting legacies of these grand narratives from above. That's a question, you know, that looking if to, into family histories can help us, us to ask questions that might challenge such generalizing and homogenizing narratives. Um, and that's a, the question also if sharing individual and family histories can be part of what Simon mentioned as openness and friendly conversations or conversations. So both your family stories in different ways are exemplary of the modern history of Eastern Europe. They include the story of emigration and escape, of social advance, um, of war and death, of trauma and survival. So I would like to ask both of you, have, how your family histories affected your work, writing and filmmaking, and in return, if and how working on the books and films dealing with some of the darkest sides of past and Eastern European past provoked you to revisit and rethink your own family stories and memories and whether going through personal and family just helps us to establish conversation and openness. Um, this is a very general question to begin with and I would like us to ask you Anne to start with sharing um, some of your stories with Eastern Europe and family. So let me just start by saying thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm very flattered to be invited to your conference on such an important topic. Um, however, you have just asked a question that is for me very difficult to answer because if you mean my personal family and my, you know, growing up my family in America, um, they had very little relationship to Eastern Europe and are in fact an example more of um, how Americanization works. Um, my, I'm, all of my grandparents were born in the United States. Um, on my mother's side, my great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents were born in the United States. And they had very, they felt very little connection to Europe actually. And they thought of themselves very much as Americans. Um, and so my interest in Eastern Europe was for them rather exotic. I mean, I could have been interested in China or butterflies or, I don't know, um, you know, an, you know ancient, ancient Greece or something. And that would have been equally to them relevant to their background. Um, it is true that my father's family is from, we, which by the way, they didn't know. They're from what is now Belarus and I, discovered that actually my father didn't know where his family were from because it had never been a subject of interest in his family. Um, I discovered it some years ago and actually went to the town where they came from and um, felt strangely distant from it and, you know, realized actually that some of the, you know, some of the ways in which people use family stories can be just as, um, I don't want to use the word phony, but it can be just as um, generalizing as the way that nations use stories. I mean, for me to feel a connection to a Belarusian village that nobody in my family had set foot in for a hundred years, you know, rather than to the American city that I grew up in seems a little artificial. Um, so so, so I'm, I'm sometimes wary of these kind of sense of family histories as 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 also having the potential to be somehow distorting. Um, I mean, I will say on your broader point, the more important point is that is how, you know, and I'd be interested to hear what Agnieszka says about this. I mean, how we use individual stories in order to tell bigger ones. Um, because 
that is something that I've done very consciously, at least in the three history books that I've written. Um, they're all about g moments of tragedy, you know, the Gulag, um, the Sovietization of Eastern Europe, uh, and the Ukrainian famine. These are, you know, mass tragedies involving millions of people and, um, you know, major world events. Um, but I, in, e in each case, I made great efforts to find either survivors or oral histories or examples from archives or memoirs that would illustrate how these big events affected individual people. Um, and all of my books I seek to do that. So, um, you know, in the, in the Gulag book, the point is not just to show, you know, the machine of terror, but also to show individuals, both camp people who were in the camps, people who were relatives of people in the camps. And then actually I made a great effort to look for stories of camp guards um, and people who worked in the camp system so that to show a little bit, they, they didn't keep as many records as, as the survivors did. But um, I did seek to show, I interviewed one and I used a few memoirs and I used archives in order to show what was their perspective as well. What did they think they were doing? Um, and I, I, I think that, um, you know, history is, best understood and, and, and can be understood in the most nuanced way if you make that effort to tell as many, you know, I mean, of course, there's obviously a limit in terms of space and, and so on, but if you can tell it as a, as a collage of different points of view, you know, what did it look like from this perspective and that perspective is a, is a really um, um, important way to tell history and also to convey it in a way that people can understand it. Um, again, if you use statistics and use big numbers, um, people can go blank or that, you know, but when you tell individual stories, um, you can, you can transmit the sense of an event better than you could, um, you know, without them. Um, so, so I would say, you know, I kind of half and a half answer to your question. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that my family or our history is so important for my writing, but more generally, the theme um, using individuals to tell stories and using different perspectives to tell a piece of history is a really important one. And I, I, I agree that it helps. Um, it's a way of fighting against these generalized and often politicized big national narratives. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anne. And I'm turning to Agnieszka because you didn't have to travel to find the place uh, of your family in Eastern Europe. You are from Eastern Europe, but that was also a journey into your family history. Um, if you would share some of your observation, how it... Well, my family history is <clears throat> East, Eastern European and um, it's mixed and uh, reflects uh, the different experiences and um, different point of views. And by the way, uh, what is Anne's approach when, when um, speaking and writing about the history is quite close to me. Of course, I am less uh, influenced by the archive work, by the uh, documentary work. Uh, of course, I try when I'm doing historical film or film speaking about the past rather, I will tell. I try to gather as many of the informations and facts um, and documentation as possible. Uh, but after I, 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 I give myself some kind of the freedom to uh, look for something which will be uh, in the same time, like the deeper truth about this particular fragment of the story or character I'm telling about, and also my personal point of view. And, um, and I'm not escaping from something which is um, actualization, not by changing the past and not the politicizing the past, but uh, by, um, by trying to find the relevant re um, resonance in, 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 the past, uh, in the past events. Uh, and uh, coming back to my to my family, my father um, my father was a Jewish uh, Jewish boy from a um, lower middle class family. Some of uh, his uncles um, have been quite successful. They've been from Vengrov, which is little town um, a little town um, in the middle of Poland. Uh, but he uh, was born and raised in Warsaw. Um, his father was a tailor. 
uh, but the, um, they put a lot of attention to give the good education to the only boy in the family, my father especially, that he was very intelligent, gifted, and very um, free-minded. He became actually some kind of the political activist when he was eight. Um, and um, he joined uh, first um, the Jewish organizations. And then um, when he realized um, the race of the antisemitism, it was 30s, he was born in, in 1920 uh, or 21. Uh, he became uh, the believing communist. It was like quite a typical reaction of the, of the um, non-Orthodox Jews to, who wanted to be actually the part of the Polish society, uh, but confronted with the growing wave of the antisemitism and the limitations of their possibilities and the glass ceiling and the aggression also. And, um, uh, and, um, and um, well, you know, we know what it was. Um, uh, they turned toward Zionism or communism. My father's first reaction was to Zionism, but very quickly he decided that he is Polish and that he that he wanted to change uh, the world around of him. Uh, he was 18 when um, the war started and he was just um, a first year student of the medicine, which shown um, how uh, bright he was because it was numerous clauses for the, for the medical studies for Jewish, um, Jewish people. Uh, when the war started, he, um, um, he escaped toward the east. It means he was in the army for a little moment, but then with the chaos which, which, which reigned, and he escaped to, the, um, uh, to, to Lviv, um, uh, leaving all his family behind in, in Warsaw. And eventually they perished all uh, except of um, one sister and one cousin in the Holocaust. Uh, and he spent the, 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 the war in the, in the Soviet Union, actually, when, when um, the Germans attacked the Soviet Union and the Nazi attacked the, the, so in the Soviet Union, he enrolled to the Soviet Army, to the Red Army. Uh, and um, uh, when the Polish um, uh, army supported and organized by the, by the communists and um, started um, uh, under um, General Berlin, uh, he enrolled there and he um, was in the first very bloody battle uh, uh, un, uh, under Lenino, uh, where the more than half of the, of the soldiers actually perished. It was, it was the bloodbath. And I think that Stalin probably somehow wanted it. Uh, or just, it, you know, I don't know exactly, but I read a lot about it. And the, of course, the opinions are mixed, but um, um, it happened in this way. My father was wounded. Um, and then when he came back to the, to his, um, and, uh, to his, um, uh, to his army, he, uh, from the hospital, he became the um, political correspondent and some kind of the commissary. Um, and growing on this, on, this, on this position, he came back to Poland with the army. Uh, he didn't know about what, what happened with his family. He didn't know really what happened with the, after the Warsaw Uprising neither. So he imagined that he will find his parents and, and siblings and, 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 and home. Uh, but instead of, of that, he found that it's nothing there left, that the Warsaw is in ruin and that his family mm, doesn't exist anymore. That it was probably mm, for this still very young man, a huge trauma. And um, it caused that he never talked about it. And I never heard from him any little glimpse of his story, uh, neither during the war, neither after, neither about his parents. I even didn't know how my grandparents, what name they had. Uh, fortunately, he um, found after the war um, his sister, Mila, who survived um, in, in, because he pretended to be, to be gentle um, in Germany on the, on the, on the forced labors. She escaped from the ghetto in the coffin of her sister who died of tuberculosis. 
uh, and after she was helped by a few um, Polish uh, friends. Uh, and when, he, when she came back, uh, she neither talked about, about the past. I actually recorded her in 1981. They emigrated, she and her family, and uh, the husband was Polish, and um, it was one who saved her during the war. Because when she was, um, when she was um, on the forced labors, um, the um, Poles who've been working together with her recognized that she is Jewish. The Polish people had like mostly very good, very good like feel who is Jewish and who is not. Uh, and um, um, her future, future, future husband, um, uh, who was very beloved, very good Polish worker working for, um, um, for, for Germans, said that it's a bullshit that she is um, his fiance from before the war and that she is absol absolutely not Jewish. And, uh, and they believed him. Uh, after they, they married, they had two sons. And in 1968, when the, uh, when the um, anti-Semitic wave um, came to, uh, to Poland again, uh, they emigrated to Sweden. Uh, so I recorded her, but unfortunately the tapes I recorded um, vanished when I emigrated and, um, and somebody probably put it someplace and I was unable to find it till now. And I remember something, but I don't remember everything about, uh, and there was like only story uh, which was told to me in, in details about, um, about my, my family. Uh, my mother was, um, as an American say, Polish Catholic, but she ceased to be the Catholic very young. Uh, she had some kind of the disillusion about, about, about Catholic faith. Uh, so she was practically at it. She was a very sensitive, um, sensitive um, girl. Both of them had very strong gene of, of, um, of justice, I will tell, tell or courage. And she joined um, um, home army, the underground, Polish underground, when she was probably 16. Um, and um, she was the part um, of the Warsaw uprising. Uh, but especially she was moved and touched by the fate of, of Polish Jews. She was very sensitive to that. And one story she told me remained with me forever. Uh, when the ghetto uprising started, um, she, was, um, she was studying in the high school, in the, in, the, in the secret hidden underground high school in Warsaw. Uh, but they lived in the suburb of Warsaw, and she was uh, taking the train uh, home. And when uh, when uh, when the uh, when the ghetto uprising started, the commentary in this train had been so terrible and so brutal, and um, so many people expressed the joy that the Jews finally will be fired, not fired, but fire, it means like whatever, uh, that when she came home, she decided that she doesn't want to live in this world. And because she had the uh, poison um, from, from, the, from, um, from her, uh, from her um, superior in the underground, she decided to take this poison. Fortunately for me, uh, they um, gave the placebo instead of the poison just to make the youth more like sure that they can eventually to escape the you know the the, the tortures uh, and she didn't die uh, but that it was her reaction and with her mm, girlfriend mm, she saved um, uh, one jewish family and um, and um, one another Jewish um, person, she pretended that he's um, her fiance. And she was very beautiful, very blonde, very Slavic um, girl. Uh, so everybody believed her and it was, uh, it was, um, it was much easier for, um, for this man to survive. Uh, the woman who, um, who, was, um, who was the mother of, uh, of the baby because they escaped from ghetto and after they've been thrown by somebody, uh, this woman Vanda had been pregnant um, eight months with with the, with the little boy, who after became my friend, um, and um, 
and she was saved and her husband and her and her son by by my mother and the, her girlfriend uh, so they became friends after the war and then and then my mother became the raters among, among the nations and and she has her tree in in, in jerusalem in yad vashem uh, this woman is still alive. My mother is still alive. She's 96. Um, this woman is still alive. She's 103. Uh, I just had the photos from her birthday, and she was around, looks beautiful, and, and is, has all her mind. Uh, and I felt that it is probably one of the greatest victor of my mother that I, 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 I can see her son and grandchildren and um, and uh, that is like you know the the the, the monument to my mother somehow uh, she decided together with the same girlfriend i will be finishing the story yes. it's, it's the epical i know mm, that when uh, the war will end she will find the, they will find both the jewish men and um, give the birth to jewish children and um, it wasn't the best way to, to, to decide the marriage, I think, and the marriage of my parents has been not very happy. Um, but um, I am this half Jewish child who was born from this decision. Um, so after, you know, after the war, it was the, 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 the wave of disillusions. Uh, the communist wasn't, the real communist wasn't what it was. They've been quiet believers, especially my father till the early 50s and after after fine after he became some kind of the half dissident and in 1961 he was arrested with the fake with the fake accusation of, of espionage and, and during the investigation he committed suicide so he died when i was 13 he was 41 and um, uh, and uh, that is his destiny and my heritage. Uh, long time to be Jewish, it meant uh, to keep the flame. It came from my mother, this knowledge, and that I'm Jewish. Uh, and, um, and it was to, 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 came to, to, to keep the flame of the martyrhood. It means to remember, to remember the tragedy. I didn't know anything about the tradition, about the Jewish history, about the Jewish religion, culture, language. Uh, this I learned much later. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka, for sharing this. And it also connects to how Anne said that through individual stories and choices, you can also see big histories and also nuance them and definitely make them human. Uh, Simon, I'm passing to you with your next question. Yes, thank you both so much for these insights. Um, very, very personal and, uh, <clears throat> and also fascinating insights, which also show so much about your work. Um, I think if we think about genealogy, we can also go the other way. We can also think forward and how our, how our narratives and stories can inspire our, our children and, and future generations. And I think in that sense, it's, it's fair to call you both memory activists. I'm not sure if that's the word you would use yourselves, um, but it seems to me that your work uh, employs the past to speak about and to the present. So I'm thinking, for example, at the uh, premiere, Agnieszka, of Mr. Jones, uh, you stood outside the, 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 uh, the theater in Berlin at the Berlinale. Um, and before the film, you uh, you had a, a you, you held up signs demanding the release of Oleg Sintsov, the Ukrainian dissident. And so, in this way, you, there was a clear uh, convergence between the the present and your your film about the Ukrainian um, famine. And as well, I think, in many ways, there's especially your your most recent book, um, Twilight of Democracy. There's so many ways in which what your the the analysis you give of, of present day um, problems you talk about you know the the, the, no, the restorative nostalgia and the uh, you, you borrow Timothy Snyder's term um, <coughs> of of medium sized lies. Um, there's so many ways in which these uses of the past and the past itself still 
um, yes, can, can still say something about our present day. Um, so I'd like to ask you, do you see a, an ethical and moral purpose in your writing and filmmaking? Uh, and is the politicization of memory inevitable, perhaps, if you take a stance? Or is there a way to remain value free? Maybe, maybe we'll go in the same orders. Uh, so perhaps Anne first. Mm, I think, yes and no. I think that the filmmaking and the kind of the creative artistic activity um, cannot just serve the um, purpose or serve the agenda, even the most noble political agenda. Sometimes uh, Mr. Jones probably is one of my most um, openly engaged films. In, and it happened because not only because I was moved by the story of this of this young courageous man, not because um, uh, I was uh, I wanted I wanted somehow put the light on, on the forgiven and forgotten Stalin's crimes, who so many people are still not aware of even with the books like Anne's books or Timothy Snyder. And, uh, but when you ask the people outside of Ukraine and, 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 and eventually part of partly Poland, if they heard about the Holodomor, mostly they don't. And I think that one of the biggest injustice, it is the fact that, that the Stalin's crimes and communist crimes um, uh, became so so easily uh, so easily forgiven and and forgotten especially forgotten uh, so it was i felt like some kind of the duty to 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 use my skills and my narrative skills and filmmaking skills to 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 revive it uh, but also because i i thought that it asks very important questions about the role of the journalism which is extremely relevant in our days when, when the societies and, and nations are polarized um, and um, when the fake news and alternative realities and the populists like Donald Trump or others uh, are using the propaganda and fake news in the, in the very you know, powerful and very dangerous way. Uh, and, the, and, the, you know, and the free media um, is something which which is the last resort, I think, to save democracy. Anyway, without free media, the democracy cannot survive. So it was, yes, I was, I was motivated also by this very, you know, urgent, very relevant political um, situation we are living through right now. Uh, but mostly, I, 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 when somebody asked me what is the message of my film, I'm telling my message, the message of my film and of all my films, by the way, is that the life is very complicated and the complexity of the human beings and the destinies and fates is something which interests me and um, and that the truth is never black and white you know it's never manichaean and it's um, uh, it's ambiguous somehow and it's what i'm really interested in and what i believe is tr the truth and i think that the simplification of the history is a lie i think that any kind of the simplification is a lie Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'll pass over to Alan. So two, two separate things. Um, one is, yes, yes, of course, I feel that engaging in history and reading history and seeking to understand history is a way of exploring and explaining the present. I mean, after all, everything that's around us, whether it's the architecture or the legal system or you know, the, the, the mentality of the people that we know and grew up with is, is shaped somehow by, by historical events. And if you, you know, in order to understand what it is, that, why you live in a society, understanding what came before it um, is really important. This is something I understand better and better as I get older, um, because now I'm, I have my own children and I also have students who don't remember things that I remember. And so I realize that they're missing a you know they, <clears throat> they're, they're you know they're they're missing a piece of what I assume, um, and the value of explaining it to them and transmitting some of the past to them becomes to me clearer than it was 
um, when I was younger. Um, I, I should say that the, the question of um, how we remember things in the relationship of kind of history and memory to politics is something that I've changed my mind about a little bit. Um, and partly it's, it's be, you know, maybe it's to do with the subjects that I've worked on, but, you know, 20 years ago when I wrote my book about the Gulag, um, I, like Agnieszka, um, I believed very deeply that what I was doing was restoring um, a missing piece of history and that um, the lack of memorials and monuments in Russia and the lack of a Russian memory of Stalin's crimes, um, you know, explained a lot of what was going wrong in contemporary Russia. Um, and while I still think that's true, and I think that the failure to have a reckoning with the past and to understand the past does explain a part of it. it's one of the reasons we got the, the for Putinism in the form that we got it, namely, um, we have a revanchist Russia that is seeking to reestablish its empire, which sees the countries around it very much, you know, through a, through a kind of Soviet lens. Um, and the, the lack of history does explain that. It's also true, though, that the, um, it, you know, I, I've, I've learned even just living in Poland over the last five or six years, that merely resurrecting history or, or resurrecting the pain of the past is insufficient. And merely building monuments to the dead or, you know, commemorating the dead every year is not enough. Um, and, you know, on the contrary, it can build a kind of sense of grievance or anger. You know, if what you focus on is tragedy and trauma and death and loss um, and the unfairness that was inflicted on our parents and grandparents, um, you can, you know, you, you create the possibility that I, that I do describe in, in Twilight of Democracy of this kind of, res, this, the, you know, restorative nostalgia, you know, nostalgia for something before that, anger at the past. And then we can see that particular disease. I mean, it's actually very notable in contemporary Poland that when the current Polish government talks about history, it doesn't talk about, you know, as Agnieszka was saying, the nuances of history or the things that went right and the things that went wrong and the different experiences that different kinds of Poles had at different times. It speaks almost exclusively about the pain and trauma inflicted by other people. Um, and this too can be very distorting. Um, and so, you know, I, I now think that history isn't, you know, the politics of history can't ever really be just about building memorials or even building museums. I mean, there are some very good museums and Poland has built some very good museums um, as of others in the region. Um, but it, it, it can't be about that. It has to be about a continual engagement and a continual questioning of history. Um, because it's true also that different historical events come to have different meanings at different times. Um, uh, you know, and this is, you know, that the, 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 the significance of one event or another, you know, begins to loom larger because of what's going on in the contemporary world. And somehow pol the, the politics of history or, the, or, the, or national, you know, historical memory policies have to allow for this. So they can't be about establishing some, you know, concrete memorial and some permanent interpretation of what happened um, that can never be shifted. Um, you know, history is, has to be a kind of constant inquisition, a constant asking of questions, a constant looking at, looking at the story from a different side. Um, you know, history is very complicated. People had different fates. There are, there are a lot of nuances. Um, and, and understanding that that is what history is, and as I said, not a concrete monument is very important. And it's of course very difficult for governments because what governments want to do is, you know, put the thing in stone and carve a name in it, or Mount Rushmore in the United States, you know, or, um, or I don't know, the, you know, particular monument to 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 a, to a particular tragedy, um, and this this can lead in the wrong direction. So just memory, you know, just saying we remember the tragedy isn't really enough. Um, what's needed is a constant interrogation of the tragedy and a constant re-examination of how it affected different kinds of different kinds of people. Thanks so much. And maybe I can just follow up yeah. really quickly, if that's okay, Sophia. Because um, I'm, I'm really interested with this idea of the medium-sized lie, which 
um, which is what has replaced the big lie of, of the, the age of totalitarianism. Um, I wonder if what you're saying is, is that you're advocating a kind of medium-sized truth that needs to be told. Yes, yeah, so, so for those who haven't read my book, which I, it's, it's not a requirement, you know, so <laughs> um, I, I did describe, in, in the book I try to describe how some modern governments, including the Polish government, um, including Trump's administration, seek to use conspiracy, really they're, we're talking about conspiracy theories, or um, half-truths or medium-sized lies, as I say, um, that as a, as a way of breaking people's confidence in their political system. So in, the, in Poland, famously, this is the, the story, the conspiracy theories that were built up around the Smolensk plane crash um, that took place a decade ago, which was caused by pilot error and by the fact that the, the president who died in the crash was seeking to get there as fast as possible. Um, and the, the, the plane crashed in, in, fog, in heavy fog, um, and a, a lot of people died. It was a terrible tragedy affecting many people that, that we knew. Um, and after it happened, the, 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 the ruling party, what's now the ruling party, built up a series of conspiracy theories around the crash. And they did have, an, they, they turned out to be much more effective than we expected them to be, precisely because what they did was um, loosen people's faith in their political institution. So if it was true that the Smolensk plane crash was caused by the Russians or by the previous government and Prime Minister Donald Tusk, and if it was true that this was all being covered up by everybody, but you know, then that means that the government and the police and the interior ministry and the, you know, the, the army and all kinds of institutions were lying. Um, and once you can convince lots of people, and, and in Poland it was about a third of the population came to view, believe some form of this conspiracy, that everyone is lying and that you can't trust anything, then you begin to have the beginnings of a radical movement that can say the system needs to be overthrown. Um, and this was a very similar technique that um, Donald Trump used in the run-up to the 2016 election when he spoke about the birtherism, so the the way in which he used the lie about Barack Obama, he wasn't really born in America, and therefore he was an illegitimate president. And again, the significance is the same. If the president is illegitimate, well, then that means that all kinds of institutions are lying or covering up, you know, Congress and the media and the CIA and the FBI, and everybody is covering this up. And once you begin to believe that, then, you know, as I say, that radicalism, uh, that's the beginning of, of, of radicalism and even violent radicalism of a kind we're beginning to see in America. Um, and so the, so the, so yes, it's true that a, you know, an, an, uh, uh, kind of, you know, constant interrogation of history can also avoid these kinds of conspiracy theories and these, and, and these kinds of, um, you know, these kind, you know, allowing these half truths to, to take hold. And very often, um, the half truths have a relationship to history. I mean, there's an enormous argument for those who are on this on this call um, who are Americans know very well that there's a, a dispute over really the very nature of American history taking place right now in the United States. Um, and that's not, a, it's not an accident that it's happening now. Um, it's, it's happening now precisely because we're at a moment when so many people are questioning the fundamentals of the political system, the basis of democracy itself. Um, and, 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 and that's leading people in, a, in directions to um, you know, to ask whether whether American history is something that should be constantly interrogated, or whether it should be a, there should be a single story that everyone agrees on. Um, so, so yes, absolutely, contemporary politics and history politics are always very closely related. Um, following uh, this thread of conversation, but also looking into the global scale and Eastern Europe, your both works uh, have international reach and various audiences in different parts of the world. Um, and while your works um, largely looked into the darkest parts of Eastern European history, I would like to, you to think about today and all the, you know, conversations and questionings globe world needs. What Eastern European history and stories from Eastern Europe can bring to this uh, conversation 
for other regions of the world and also a global conversation. Are these stories only of the dark times or something else? The topics that you looked deeply into, but maybe also something that you see right now um, and see the potential for um, contributing or questioning or asking and having communication, not inside of our region, but rather going beyond. Um, so I will reverse um, uh, the question, the, the order and will ask Anne and then ask Agnieszka to, to think about. Um, Anne, so what are the topics and what are the questions from here? So you, you have caught me, I literally last week, I was in Istanbul um, and I was at the house of a quite well-known Turkish journalist and writer. And he showed me his bookcase and his bookcase was, you know, Václav Havel, Timothy Snyder, um, you know, one book after the next about the history of Eastern Europe. I'm sure he's seen Agnieszka Holland's films as well. Um, and he said to me, um, and he's, he's, he's a man who's in his 70s, he's been through different phases of his life, you know, and, and understanding his own nation's history. But he said to me, you know, the um, understanding the Central European intellectuals and their struggle um, both to understand their own past and also their struggle to establish liberalism and their arguments about what a liberal society would and should be um, after 1989, was for him profoundly enlightening, you know, to help him understand how, you know, how his own country's, so much of his own country's history had been covered up. I mean, he later, um, having grown up not knowing about the Armenian genocide, he later came to write a book about it. Um, and part of the book is about one of his own ancestors' role in it. Um, and, 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 he, and he told me that he was helped all along by these arguments about history and memory that were taking place in Eastern Europe. So that's, it's about as direct an example of how the history of Eastern Europe sheds light on the history of a place that seems superficially quite different, namely, you know, the history of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire. Um, you, you, know, you know, simply the, the conversation about what is, how do we understand the past when so much of it has been covered up and hidden from us? Um, turned out to be very useful there, and I'm sure it has implications all over the world in in Latin America and South Africa and in in in, in Asia. Um, I'll tell you one before I the one other thing I want to say that, um, but I was once at a I was once asked to give a seminar at it was actually Yale University at at uh, they had a kind of seminar for there were, it doesn't matter why but there were people from all over the world in the room. Um, and they asked me to speak about, it was not that long after I'd published my book on the Gulag, and they asked me to speak about precisely this issue, namely the question of history and, remem and memory in Russia um, and memory of the Gulag, and I gave my talk. And then the most extraordinary thing happened, which is that one by one, every single person in the room said, oh, but we have exactly these issues in my country too. You know, somebody from Australia started speaking about the Aborigines and how, you know, the crimes committed against them and how those have been covered up. Somebody from Zimbabwe spoke about um, the history of that country. Somebody from Argentina spoke, you know, somebody from France started talking about Vichy. Um, and it turns out that this question of what is remembered publicly and what is not remembered, which is so central to the intellectual conversation in Eastern Europe, is actually an international question um, and it applies anywhere. And the final thing I was going to say is that, uh, you know, even when the, the subjects and the issues can seem quite different, I actually do increasingly find that um, you can use stories from this region to illuminate other things. So another, I'll give you as my, my final anecdote. Um, last summer, I wrote a, an article for The Atlantic on the, on the subject of collaboration. Um, and why people give up their ideals um, or what they had previously stated as their ideals in order to work close to power. Um, and this was, an, in fact, an article about Washington and it was about Trump's Washington and because it was so striking how many people I heard using language that I recognized from the history of Eastern Europe. You know, people having arguments about, you know, should I work for a government whose fundamental philosophy I disagree with? 
um, you know, what's the correct stance to my party when my party goes off in a direction that I that I that I find difficult. Um, and, the, and the piece opened actually with a long, I mean, it's amazing the Atlantic let me do this, but it was kind of a very long anecdote about two East Germans, um, uh, Marcus Wolf and Wolfgang Leonard, who made very different decisions about collaboration very early in the 1940s. They, they were both East German communists who were sent back to Berlin um, at the, at, at, um, in, in May of 1945. And one, Marcus Wolf stayed and eventually became a very senior figure and the head of the East German Secret Service. And Wolfgang Leonard eventually defected first to Yugoslavia and then eventually to the United States. And the question of, and, and I discovered that the, I worried a little bit about writing this article because, you know, East Germany is so obscure to modern Americans and, you know, the Atlantic is a, you know, popular middle brow magazine read by lots of people, but I discovered that this attempt to describe this dilemma and the attempt to explain what, what could have been the different influences on these two men who'd had very similar backgrounds. They were both from communist families. They both grew up in Moscow, even though they were Germans, um, turned out to have quite a universal significance. Um, and people recognized immediately the significance of the story and why it was relevant um, even to modern American politics. So I find that, you know, I'm, I'm, and by the way, I'm sure this can be true of other regions, but um, but many of the questions of, of you know the individual running up against ideology, running up against uh, authoritarianism, um, you know, individuals in the face of you know mass changes and mass movements that are so familiar to us from this region, I find they have actually a lot of import and echo in in many other countries around the world, up to and including the United States. Um, Agnieszka, you know, if, I mean, few cultural products reach as broader audiences as films, and you also have this, uh, I mean, sense of what what are these different audiences and what can speak to them or what can challenge these different audiences, telling histories from Eastern Europe to your global film audiences. What are the topics that you find? Um, inspiring, relevant? Well, I agree with Anne very much. I'm sorry that I so often agree with her and maybe it makes our conversation a little repetitive. Uh, but um, uh, I think that the history of um, Eastern Europe or Central Europe can be the laboratory, kind of the laboratory for the, for the global history and in many, in many countries, in many regions, um, um, our experiences and, and the mechanism which are shaping um, um, the, the history in our countries. And I'm, I'm thinking Poland, of course, but also Czech Republic, Slovakia, um, ex-Yugoslavia, Romania, um, Hungary, uh, Ukraine, um, Belarus, and so on and so on. They, 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 they are relevant for, um, for several countries, for several regions. I, I have the similar experience with, the, with showing my movies um, or discussing about my movies or Polish movies or um, Central European movies with, uh, for example, um, um, in, uh, in, in India. Uh, just recently, I had the webinar and Q and A with the, with the group of Indian filmmakers and um, uh, and film scholars, and for them, our movies and my movies, maybe particularly or Vaid, Andrzej Vaida's movies, are speaking directly to the heart. They have impression that we are talking about them, about their experience, even if history of India is so different from Polish history, and the culture is so different, you know the. The, the social situation is so different, but it's a lot of similarities which make our way to telling the story very relevant for, uh, for them, to them. Uh, and then, then it, the most funny I heard, it was that they don't like French movies. The French movies are not interested, interesting to them because they are so non brealist and so like self-involved and so bourgeois. Uh, and when they see our movie, they they find exactly the you know the expression of their own and their deeper experience. Uh, 
we are, you know, the fate of the Central European citizen in 20th century is something which fascinates me because um, it fascinates, it fascinates me and in the same time I, 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 I feel the great sadness because um, the, to, in order to survive, you have to accommodate to so different uh, regimes and systems that um, very few individuals are able of the total freedom there, even if it's a period of the freedom, like we had this 30 years of, of Polish democracy after 1989. I think that the people never really accommodate to that. They never really embrace it. They, had, they have such a deep genetic memory of, of um, of the conformism and of the acceptance of, of, um, of the power, which sometimes is a strange power coming from the outside. And sometimes it's our local power we are choosing um, exactly escaping the freedom, like is the case I think right now. Uh, so, um, so it is very interesting to, to, to tell this story, especially the stories of the first part of the 20th century in, in, in this region. Uh, and unfortunately, it, 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 it rings the bells and becomes, as I said uh, before, uh, very relevant. Uh, and now we, we see, we, are, we can watch something like the you know, global international of um, uh, populist nationalists which is oxymoron by itself, somehow how you can have the international of the nationalism, but um, with the special flair of, of, um, of this populism, authoritarian populism, it becomes possible. Um, so we are really living the times when, when um, telling the stories about the um, 30s of 20th century in Germany, in, in Russia, in Poland, it becomes very instructive. Um, and um, I think the Turkish, um, Turkish um, audiences, um, uh, Indian or audiences, Brazilian audiences, and um, after experience of Donald Trump, which didn't end yet, we are in the middle of, of you know, of, of, of something which we, where the future is unknown. Um, also make sensitive uh, to this kind of the experience also American and um, American audience. So when I'm showing my movies um, um, around of the world, I, I, I don't have the big troubles with the, with the communication and, um, and the understanding um, of, um, of the reality I'm, 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 I'm showing. Uh, some Polish movies are pretty obscure to the, to the, to the global audience. Some of them, are so um, deeply rooted in the very specific, um, spec very Polish um, situation that they um, um, become um, somehow hermetic to the uh, to the uh, to the other cultures or other experiences. Um, and I always try to to be understandable, and it. It didn't need too much of efforts for me. I think that my way of communication um, is um, is so that the people easily understand what 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 kind of the experience I am sharing with them, and what kind of the content um, can break break the the, the borders and um, awake some kind of the. Um, empathic um, emotional um, emotional reaction thank you so much for both of your answers <clears throat> um we'd like to keep asking you questions pretty much forever but we'd, we'd also want to give a chance to the uh, audience who are watching on on various platforms to ask questions we have one from ella rossmiller uh, whose question is directed to Anna Applebaum, but I, I think Agnieszka would, might also have something to say. Um, the question is, for many years, the US saw itself as a beacon of democracy to the world, including countries behind the Iron Curtain. Now the torch of Lady Liberty has dimmed. I wonder if the time has come for the US to learn how to fight for democracy from Eastern European dissidents. I use their, their positive lessons as well from Eastern Europe. Does it only offer, does Eastern Europe only offer lessons of the mechanism of totalitarianism in the past and illiberalism in the present? Or does it 
offer more positive lessons for Democrats with a lowercase d? Um, so, yes, thanks for that question. I mean, yes, I think absolutely, um, building on what Agnieszka just said, I think there are quite a lot of lessons from East European distance. I mean, actually, very specifically, um, the things that the Ukrainians learned from fighting Russian disinformation, I know for an absolute fact, have been used and studied by people who are looking at trying to understand how disinformation works in the United States, including at some tech companies. I mean, it's not, it's a, um, it's, it's now well understood that some of the tactics of modern authoritarian populism that are used in democratic countries have their origin in Russia and, and the region. And some of the thinking about how to push back against them absolutely, um, you know, is, is going to come from here. Um, I mean, more broadly, I think the U.S. does still play a really important role in, um, in fighting for democracy. And I think that certainly Biden himself and some of his administration now increasingly see, you, you know, almost as, it, you know, an internet, you know, that the, the, there's a kind of international battle, you know, that some of the things that they're fighting inside the United States are the same things that they're fighting in Europe and elsewhere. Um, and, and they're increasingly looking to make international alliances, um, both in the traditional, you know, kind of NATO EU space, but I think also beyond that, um, in looking for original ways to push back against this wave of disinformation, the wave of, um, of, um, attacks on media and on the independence of courts and, and, and other kinds of institutions. So, um, so, I mean, y yes, I think not, not only is that true, I think it's, increasingly pretty well understood, um, at least by some people in Washington. I'm not sure that it's yet found, you know, it's not yet clear from Biden's foreign policy that how this is going to work. But uh, I, I think that the, at the intellectual level, there is that understanding is already there. Um, there is also a question coming, um, which follows on this, you know, what, what Eastern Europe can bring to the table. And uh, we are moving around this. And one of them is in Agnieszka's family history, uh, there was this word emancipation and justice. And uh, one of the question comes to the history of rights, you know, women's rights. And uh, Eastern Europe used to be a playground or an experimentation, sometimes with very high price of how you change of social justice. So, and also of rights. Uh, and right now we see in Poland how all, I mean, how much trouble is that with that, what's happening with women's rights. At the same time, we do see that in, across Central and Eastern Europe, there are very different patterns. So it's very hard to generalize um, different societies um, have you know, different reaction to these legacies. Um, in your opinion, you know, um, as you're both very much uh, in that uh, with Polish context. So how Polish development, development in Poland with women's rights, especially, is something that is, um, um, sheds the, the larger trend or how we actually thinking about history and questioning bringing more other histories of Eastern Europe, we can open the conversation saying that this is not only a conservative or there are other stories to tell and there are other experiences to advance um, human rights or um, or, or talk about injustices. Agnieszka, you are very much in the conversation today. And, you know, some of our listeners uh, maybe read your recent post to The Guardian. So, you know, what, what are the messages and what are the worries if you think about women's rights and if you think about uh, justice? Um, I have a lot of anger when I'm thinking about the situation of Polish women and um, 
And also I feel guilty myself because for quite a long time, you know, I accepted the, the mainstream thinking that the uh, women's rights are secondary uh, to another freedoms, uh, to the political freedom, to the, you know, to the, um, to the um, uh, social um, peace, um, and in the first place um, to, to the Catholic Church. Um, Poland is different from other countries, especially in the Czech Republic, which is another, my another homeland somehow, because I, I studied there and um, it was my formative years happened in, in Prague during the Prague Spring and later during the normalization period. And um, uh, so my political, social, uh, culture, filmmaking experience um, was, was uh, shaped there. And they are two different countries exactly because, you know, they, because the, um, the Czechs are not uh, believers, they are not religious. Maybe one of the less religious nation in Europe. And the Poles is the opposite. Um, and the Polish Catholic Church is re um, um, reinforced by the political past and the fact that the Poland didn't exist for 150 years and the, and the, and the Catholicism and the church was like some kind of the of the of the of the um, of the unification of the national unification and some kind of the you know of the of the help in the in the battle. Sometimes they, it it been help. Sometimes it was the opposite. But in, anyway, in the memory, in the national memory, the church is uh, we 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 all own to the church especially um, during communist times we, we own to the church the support for um, for national conscience and freedom it, it happened to be very unlucky very unhappy for um, very unlucky and very unhappy for the for the fate of polish women um, poland was one of the first countries anyway very early the, the women had the voting rights before France, because before Switzerland, before many advanced countries, uh, but nothing nothing came out of that. Maybe it's also because the Poland is the, like the men are the warriors. It means it's tradition that you know that the men are fighting and women are in the shadow helping them. And um, um, I'm at the front with many, many um, women from um, democratic opposition in Poland in, in the 70s, 80s, and, um, and, and, um, and um, especially in 80s, they've been the main actors of the democratic opposition and the fight for, for freedom and democracy. Uh, but their names names became unknown to the to the general audience, and they never like wanted to 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 put themselves in front. They always was hiding somehow behind the men with the big names of the opposition, doing maybe eighty, maybe ninety, sometimes percent of the work of the real work. Uh, and they thought that it's fine like that, you know, that the men need to be, you know on the spotlight that also that the society will follow rather rather men than the women and i think it's changing right now it means i really think i really believe that this um, women's strike which failed somehow because of the low ter this terrible law and human um, um, law have been have been um, have been um, accepted uh, uh, but the change, especially among the women of the young generation, is huge. It's probably, it's probably connected to the demographic uh, crisis and the fact that uh, uh, it's ver very much of the children are unique children, and suddenly the parents are investing what they invested before in the in the boys. They invest in their daughters, and the daughters um, have much stronger self conscience and the feeling of self importance and self value. So the young women uh, in Poland um, will not be accepting this uh, shadow position and. Um, and um, will not accept to resign from their very basic uh, rights uh, just to serve some political agenda of, um, of, um, of men. Anne, you know, like to turn with this question to you, but I mean, probably um, 
you know, like follow it in the direction of the history we can use and to the stories that we can recover. And socialist and communist rule of the 20th century heavily used and instrumentalized the question of social justice rights claiming its superiority on these issues. Is there a way of recovering these stories uh, and bringing them back to the table? I just, you know, I just came across a workshop about Kolontai in Tallinn, supported by the Ministry of Social Affairs, um, and discussing the, I mean, the local, or let's say the um, histories of that. I'm thinking about my own place of Lvov, where much of the talk about rights actually happened in the interwar city. Uh, between Polish, Jewish, Ukrainian inhabitants, some of them and some of the, you know, like uh, most forward thinking was actually on the left. And later it was heavily uh, used in communist storytelling. Is there a way to rescue these stories or retell them and, uh, and use for the contemporary? So if you think about this questioning and interrogating the past in respect to contemporary challenges and problems we have. I mean, in, a, in answer to that, let me say two separate things. I mean, one, there was actually a way in which the communist regimes poisoned the idea of feminism, whatever word you want to use, female independence, um, um, female emancipation, um, precisely because they trumpeted themselves as doing it. And in practice, what it meant was that women had to work all day and then they had to come home and stand in queues in the evening and then stay up taking care of children. You know, and there was, there was even, um, I remember this quite clearly, and it was very noticeable in Russia, maybe a little bit less so in Poland. There was a kind of counter reaction to that in the 1990s whereby lots of young women said, I don't want anything to do with that. I want to marry somebody rich um, and I want to stay home all day because this, you know, this horrible life that was created for me by the communist regimes isn't something that I want at all. And so there was a way, I mean, you're right, in which the, that language about justice and equality and so on was undermined and ruined for people because the reality was so different from the ideal and from uh, and as I said, this is particularly very particularly Russian not notable in Russia. I think it's a little bit less 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 true in some in some other places. Um, and so y yes, I do think that finding a way both of bringing back the stories. I mean, Alexander Kolontai is a fascinating um, historical figure, very amusing as well. I mean, her affair with the sailor, and then she's the ambassador. And even when she becomes ambassador, she's becomes a critic of the Bolsheviks. But from she was in Sweden, as far as I remember. Um, so, so yes, there are, there are lots of those figures that are worth recovering and, and thinking about again. Um, but, but you know, you know, the problem with seeking to resurrect, I don't know, the communist language or ideology is that you'll run immediately into the problem of, you know, how disastrous it was in practice for many actual women. Um, and, and it had these, you know, it had this almost contrary impact um, on so many of them. I mean, the second thing I would say that is that, um, you know, we were just talking about before about how so many Polish and Central European stories can be, you know, are illustrative of bigger issues. I mean, I actually think that that works the same way around and that what a lot of what's the arguments about women in Poland are actually reflective also of a larger international trend. Um, you know, there, you, you, there are now several European countries. Spain is it's very significant in Poland, France. Um, and elsewhere, there are these very significant um, kind of, um, I don't know what the right, exactly the right word is, but sort of revolutionary, um, reactionary Catholic movements that are seeking very actively to pick apart um, the, both the legal protections for women to do with, you know, even to do with family law and family violence, um, as well as laws and and, and customs around around gay rights and other you know and other and other related issues, um, and Poland is really part of that larger trend. 
Um, and it's, I think it's even leading to, there's even a division inside the Catholic Church about whether this is good or bad. Um, and I'm hoping that that argument will eventually come out and, and, and get a little bit louder because many of the groups that are pushing for these kind of reactionary rewriting of the legal system, and they're doing it in nationally, and they're doing it in some cases Europe, at the European level, um, some of them have caused unquiet and some discontent inside the hierarchy at, at the Vatican and the Catholic Church. And I, I hope some, that's all been kind of, um, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a big, there's not a big public argument, but I'm hoping that there will be. I mean, certainly the current Pope um, is not somebody who was famously reactionary or famously looking to pick apart, um, you know, achievements on, on homosexual rights and in fact began his papacy with exactly the opposite kind of language. Um, so, so I'm not sure that we, you know, although there are these church related movements that are pushing that way in a number of places, also including in the United States, um, you know, they, are, they aren't necessarily gonna win. And I, one of the things that I hope will happen in Poland and in other places is that there begins to be a more conscious coalition between um, women's rights activists, some people inside the church and inside Catholic movements, you know, liberal, you know, liberal Catholics, um, who can begin to put together coalitions and linkage who can push back against, against these reactionaries. It's a, and it's something that should be done both within countries and also across borders, um, certainly inside Europe. Thank you. Thanks so and I'm much. passing to Simon. Um, yeah, we have we have two questions which I'll try and link together. Uh, I'll, I'll try at least. One is from Alexandra Vitz, who says uh, they both they both aimed at Agnieszka, but I think they 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 also very um, pertinent to Anne as well. Alexandra Vitz says, "I was fascinated by your comment about how the need of the poles to continuously accommodate to different regimes left a population that never fully emerged from those regimes. In a certain sense." there always remain the imprint and shadow of those regimes. Could you comment a little bit more about this? So it's, it's I guess it means, you know, a uh, kind of post-colonial sensitivity to, to how those narratives of the actual past regimes continue to uh, influence us. And I think this links very well to, this, to a second question from Martin Nord, who says, imagination has played a role in this conversation, especially in terms of filling in the gaps between the residue of history. But what role does imagination play in thinking about other possible futures still tied to the past? So putting those two questions together, I might add a third one, uh, that's kind of getting a bit too much, of how, how do you tell stories about the future which are liberated from those narratives of the past? Uh, maybe we'll put that to Agnieszka first because they were um, notionally directed at you. <laughs> Please choose from any any of the, the three. <clears throat> well, I'm telling about some kind of the imprint which 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 uh, which you can feel in the um, Eastern Central European um, um, genetic code because of the experiences of those countries. And, and even if they are very different from each other, they have very much in common as well. Um, but speaking about, about Poland, I, I remember like 20 years ago and maybe even before, um, I met in, in Washington some uh, professor, unfortunately I, I forgot his name, who was studying the um, uh, Polish um, community in the US, it means Polonia, and, um, and also black community. And he compared those two communities telling that they have very, a lot of in common. And especially the difficulty to, 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 to deal with the democratic tools and um, some ambitions and expectations, how to, um, how to, um, how to how to fulfill their ambitions in the in the in the in the society on the higher level that they um, that they accept to be to stay in the middle or lower middle class very easily and he was um, um, he was believing that somehow um, it happens because uh, the, the those both community have some memory of the slavery 
of course, Polish um, peasant slavery um, was different from, from, from black slavery in, in, in America. Um, but he found that it's some similarities because of that. It became quite fashionable by especially left side Polish historians to, to analyze the problems the Polish society can have for the centuries and today uh, by the fact um, of the, that the situation of peasants for the centuries have been extremely rough and um, injustice was running through the generations and generations. Uh, and maybe, you know, maybe it is one of the biggest problems, especially that no one was dealing with that for, for the very long time. And um, American and Polish um, and immigration is specific by coming mo mostly in by the end of 19th and beginning of 20th century from the, from the very poor region of Poland, from the countryside, from, and they are mostly the heirs of Polish peasants who've been who've been bearing this, this quite heavy historical past. So, it, you know, I, it's just the, some intuitions from my side because I don't, I don't, have, I don't have the data. I, 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 I never went very deeply into the sociological research. I just feel that, it, that, that somehow it is true that this heritage is, is shaping our, our, our present. Thanks very much, Agnieszka. And so when I, 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 this question about imagination in the future is, um, although it sounds vague, is actually quite important um, because one of the mistakes that um, many of us have made over the last several decades has been the assumption, this Tim Snyder writes about this very well, the assumption that the future is somehow inevitable. In other words, We've always had liberal democracy. Liberal democracy has won. Therefore, we don't really need to do that much in order to make sure that it stays in power. We can leave politics to the professionals, the politicians. They can have their arguments about things, and the rest of us can get on with making money, you know, or writing books or whatever, painting houses. Um, and that assumption was a big mistake um, because, in fact, um, the future is never inevitable in any either way. It is not inevitable that our civilization will decline, nor is it inevitable that our civilization will triumph. <laughs> um, and reminding people constantly that the future is radically open and that, you know, history will be what we make it and that all of us have our role to play in what happens tomorrow and what happens to our countries and what happens to our political systems, um, I think is one of the most important messages that any, you know, any person who writes or makes films or paints pictures um, can, can give people, um, you know, this consciousness of responsibility, that we are responsible for how we live and for how, you know, for how our societies work and that that, and that, and the, you know, the possibility of change in either direction is always open, um, is, is, is extremely important. Um, you know, to fight against any kind of, you know, nihilism, you know, oh, we can't do anything, you know, we have no influence, or any kind of sense of um, complacency. Everything is fine, it will all get better. Our constitution is so great, this is, you hear this in America a lot, then it will, it will everything will work out, you know. Um, so fighting against both of those two things, I think, is really the really should be the primary goal of of you know political conversation as well as as well as a lot of art. Um, and um, of course, what I like about Agnieszka's films is they do exactly that. I mean, they point, um, they show how things could have gone. They point open. They're always open to the future, um, and that's really what um, great film and great art should be doing. Um, well, thank mm, you. yeah, uh, it means I, I think that the future is unknown and um, that anything can happen and that in this fatalistic point of view that uh, 
And anyway, whatever whatever we'll do, we cannot change, you know, the future. It's um, it's something which um, is felt very much um, in several countries right now, and which is um, which has an extremely negative in, in impact on um, uh, dealing with the real problems we are facing, and we are, which which are totally new, and the challenges and uh, and dangers um, um, we are we are we, we are pre feeling in this time of transition are huge and need and need incredible imagination i think that somehow you know the the, the situation today um, needs artists with the imagination more than somebody who is just collecting data and um, um, asking the uh, public opinion about um, about the facts and we we need somebody who will be breaking what seems to be fatalistic um, fatalistic um, how to tell it uh, inevitable um, destiny of the humanity which uh, which which grows to some kind of the of the of the um, uh, global disaster we know that we 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 have this danger in front of us but uh, we know also that without changing completely the way of feeling and thinking we will not resolve it uh, thank you, Anne and Agnieszka. And this question kind of put us into the anticipation of the future. We will be looking to your future books and your future films and hope that maybe some of them will be dealing with memory or history or Eastern Europe in some combination. But I think that what you picked up at the end, that future is in the present with our choices, with our deeds, with our engagement, but also with our revisiting of the past and collaboration across different disciplines. I think that what Agnieszka just said a bit about art and then research and politicians, we are all in the same boat, even if we are in the same boat, even if we are in different countries or different disciplines. Um, we would like to thank you very much for your conversation today. Um, thank you, Roma and uh, Memory Association Conference for making this possibility uh, to engage and uh, to have conversation with you. Uh, Simon, uh, that's, you could say a few words more to say goodbye and we call it a day. Yeah, it, it's been a fantastic honor. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we had a, a very productive um, and genuinely interesting conversation. So thank you, thank you so much. Maybe we should give Roma, who's the chair, the, the very final word. <coughs> But we will uh, we'll be wrapping up now. So yeah, again, thanks very much. Uh, I also would like to thank you all the speakers uh, on behalf of, of, of co-organizers for, for tonight. I would like to thank you, the audience, for staying with us. And the only thing that uh, remains uh, to conclude this, this discussion that ends on such an optimistic note is that we can meet tomorrow for more discussions on entanglements of Eastern Europe <laughs> and outer world. And I hope that in case we meet in person in the future, we would definitely have still new problems to, to open and unpack and will never end with the, this, this discussion will not, not stop. So thank you and have a good night or good afternoon wherever you are. And thank you once again to all our speakers uh, for, for today. Thank you so much. <laughs>